The text that we consider tonight is Isaiah 53, verse 10. And we'll pick up our reading in Isaiah 52. Reading from verse 7 of Isaiah 52 through Isaiah 53, the whole of the chapter. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward, rear reward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper 
in his hand. Ye shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Thus far we read, I call your attention to verse 10 tonight. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This prophecy, beloved congregation, of Isaiah took place about seven to eight hundred years B.C. before Christ. And by a wonder of God, the prophet Isaiah, about seven to eight hundred years before Christ, was able to see and able by God's inspiration to write about the cross of Jesus Christ and the events surrounding His crucifixion. Isaiah is not able to see Pontius Pilate personally or to see Annas or Caiaphas or any of the chief priests personally. But he is able to see all of the pain that they would inflict upon Jesus Christ in his arrest and trial and in the events leading to his crucifixion. He is able to see the stripes on the back of Jesus Christ caused by the whips. He's able to see Jesus Christ bloodied and bruised, and mocked, and scorned, and rejected of men. Now, here in the text, he sees Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. Before this, in the chapter, Isaiah is describing the life of Jesus Christ in his lifelong suffering. He is describing what his tormentors and persecutors did to him to heap upon him suffering and pain. But now Isaiah sees Jesus on the cross. He doesn't mention the cross. He maybe isn't able to see very clearly how Jesus would die. But he's able to see spiritually what happened at the cross. What Isaiah is describing here in the text is what happened on that Friday over 2,000 years ago from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross. And what does He see? What does He describe here for us? Well, as I said, he doesn't see the cross. He doesn't describe for us the nails that were pounded through the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. And at this point, he doesn't tell us about the activities of the enemies, the tormentors of Jesus Christ, and all of the things that they did to mock Him and to shame Him. No. He sees the activity of the Lord. Jehovah. And he sees the deep spiritual suffering of Jesus Christ. In fact, we could say that, that Isaiah, seven to eight hundred years before the death of Jesus Christ, is able to see more clearly what so many today do not see. 
Many today only see the physical suffering of Jesus Christ. And that's what they focus on. But Isaiah is able to see spiritually what happened that Friday when Jesus was crucified. Jehovah bruised Him. Jehovah made His soul an offering for sin. Because Isaiah is able to see what Jehovah God did at the cross of Jesus Christ, and able to see that He bruised and put Him to grief, he is able to see that there at the cross, there was an offering made for sin. And he's able to see on the basis of that offering made for sin. There's going to be blessing and prosperity for the Redeemer and for His seed. So tonight, people of God, we see the cross of Jesus Christ from the perspective of this prophecy. We see not merely cold-blooded murder taking place on that Friday night, but we see the activity of the Lord God bruising His Son, making an offering and bringing blessing and prosperity to his people. So let's consider this passage under the theme bruised by Jehovah. And we're going to notice in the first place the heavy blow that bruised Jesus at the cross on Good Friday. Secondly, we're going to consider that that is therefore a sin offering. A sin offering was made. And then thirdly, we will see the prosperity of the seed. Bruised by Jehovah, the heavy blow, the perfect sin offering, and the prosperous seed. Seven to eight hundred years before Jesus Christ, as Isaiah sees the events of the crucifixion of Jesus and all of the things surrounding His crucifixion, he is able to see that Jehovah was sovereign and ruled over the death of His Son. That's how you need to understand the word pleased in the text. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. When Isaiah says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he's speaking about the good pleasure of God, and he's not speaking now about what the Lord delights in necessarily, what makes him happy, what brings him joy, but he's speaking about the good pleasure of God's plan, His counsel, God's will. This is what it pleased the Lord to do. In His eternal counsel, God has planned everything. And God controls everything that happens in the world according to that plan. And now Isaiah sees that included in this plan of God, in His will of good pleasure, is the death of Jesus Christ. On Friday, it pleased God that Jesus would die on the cross. Isaiah teaches us here very clearly already in the Old Testament. He understood that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ would not originate with the plan of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is not the first one to plan the death of Jesus Christ on that Wednesday night when he plotted with the chief priests to betray Jesus and to turn Him over to the chief priests. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, His death did not originate with the chief priests who during the ministry of Jesus Christ determined that they wanted to kill Him, that He needed to be put to death. And it wasn't even first of all the devil who stood behind all of those evil men and all of those evil deeds that those men did in arresting Jesus and in trying Him and in crucifying Him. The devil did not first plan the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Isaiah teaches us tonight 
as we think about the death of Jesus Christ, not to think that in this, in wicked men taking hold of the Prince of Life, the only begotten Son of God, and nailing Him to the cross, that evil triumphed over good, that the devil triumphed over God. Rather, God ruled that Friday night. God used all of those men. He used even the devil as His instruments to carry out His good pleasure. This pleased Jehovah. This applies to Judas Iscariot's betrayal of Jesus Christ. That Wednesday night when he left the upper room and met with the chief priests and plotted to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, that was the good pleasure of the Lord. And when that band of soldiers accompanied the chief priests and went into the Garden of Gethsemane and arrested Jesus Christ, that was according to the good pleasure of Jehovah. When he was tried and he was silenced, his accusers came with false testimony, false charges against him, and he answered them not. And they beat him and spit upon him and whipped him. That was according to the good pleasure of the Lord. And then finally, when they led him to Golgotha, and they crucified Him at 9 o'clock that Friday morning. That was according to the good pleasure of Jehovah. God was in control. That's what Isaiah prophesied. That's what we see in the New Testament. We see the fulfillment of the prophecy. Those wicked men weren't in control. The children understand that. The children could explain that Jesus Christ was actually sovereign and in control in, in all of these events. You could point to that Wednesday night in the upper room when it was Jesus who dismissed Judas Iscariot, sovereignly saying to Judas, that thou doest do quickly. And the children probably remember from catechism in the Garden of Gethsemane when that band came to arrest Jesus Christ and Jesus spoke for the first time, all of those soldiers with their mighty earthly weapons, their swords and their spears, they fell back. Jesus was sovereign. But the New Testament, and it's more important for us to see that tonight in the light of this passage in Isaiah, the New Testament confirms that the crucifixion was planned by God in His will of good pleasure. That's what Peter declared on that day of Pentecost when in Acts 2, verse 23, he speaks of Jesus as Him who was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He goes on to say, you have taken Him, you took Him with wicked hands and you crucified Him, you slew Him, you murdered Him. But that was according to the eternal good pleasure, the eternal determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And then too, in Revelation 13, verse 8, John and we are told of a book. It's the book of life. The book containing the names of the elect. And it's known, called in heaven, the Lamb's book of life. Or the book of life of the Lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world. God determined. God determined not in the year 33 A.D. Not when Jesus Christ was about 33 years old. Not even after the creation of the world, but in eternity. This was God's good pleasure. 
Jesus Christ would be slain. And so Isaiah teaches us God was in control. The wicked men were His instruments. But that's not really what Isaiah speaks about in the text. God used wicked men as instruments in order to fulfill His plan in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But Isaiah is not speaking here about God using any human instrument. He's speaking about what God did that Friday at the cross. Yet it pleased Him to bruise Him. He hath put Him to grief. What Isaiah is speaking about must have terrified Him. He must have almost shrunk from this Word of God. It's unspeakable. It's almost unimaginable. When he says he made his soul an offering for sin, you need to read that back to the beginning of the text and understand that this way. God bruised his soul. Not his body. His soul. This can't be reenacted. This cannot be dramatized. Men, and you can imagine this, men can imagine and can even picture what it's like to be nailed to a cross. Maybe you've never experienced that kind of physical pain, but yet you can understand something of what Jesus endured in that physical pain. And the hatred and the mockery, the cutting words spoken by His enemies. Maybe you've never endured such hatred and mockery, but you can understand something of the pain of enduring that as Jesus did on the cross. And that shame to be publicly hanged between earth and heaven, naked on the cross. You can understand something of the humiliation Jesus endured. But this, what Isaiah describes here is how God bruising him for sin. We don't know what hell is like. We will never go to hell or experience hell. It's a mystery to us. And yet we need to understand something of the reality of hell in order to understand what Isaiah is saying here in this passage when he's speaking about the Lord bruising Jesus. We need to understand that hell is the awful place that God has created for the everlasting punishment, judgment of the wicked for their sins. The place in which God and all of His wrath and all of His anger will react to the sins of the wicked by punishing them with the judgment and the agony and the terror that they deserve in His righteous and holy reaction to sin. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. I'll mention it again tonight. So awful is the reality of hell that even the devil shudders to think about the eternal and awful agony he will endure when God sends him to hell. What was it? What did Jesus endure on the cross? Well, he did suffer God's punishment. All of God's wrath and hatred and anger as a reaction of God's righteousness against sin that we deserve for our sins. And Isaiah speaks of it this way. 
He bruised him. The heavy hand of God bruised him. And maybe the best way to try to capture what Isaiah is speaking of here is to use a couple of pictures. First of all, when we think of bruising, we think of physical pain that has been suffered by a physical blow. Only now don't think, children, of your brother or sister hitting you on the arm and causing a bruise on your arm. Think instead of a semi-truck traveling 80 miles an hour, smashing into your body. That's the kind of bruise. That's the kind of blow. Only that won't quite do. Because you see, that's a physical blow that does physical damage, causes physical bruises. Isaiah says, he bruised his soul. That's far worse. Far, far more painful. And so the second comparison would be this. Think of a child, a son, who loves his father. His father has hurt him. Not by striking him with his fist. Not by beating him physically in any way. But this way. Not loving that son. Think of the pain. Not showing that son any favor. But pouring hatred. Anger. Forsaking that son. Beloved, Jesus was silent when the men did their worst to him, Pilate and Herod and all the Jews. He didn't say a word. But when God bruised his soul, he cried out. This is when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the blow that Jesus suffered on Calvary's cross. It's very important that we see God was active. That we look at this not from the point of view of men and see at the cross of Jesus Christ that there was some great travesty, some great miscarriage of justice. This is what we must see. Jesus suffered the blow of God's wrath against His soul. And that's important because then we can see that God made an offering for sin that Friday night. The wicked murder Jesus. That's what Peter charges them with in Acts chapter 2 when he says, you have with wicked hands crucified and slain Him. The word slain there is murdered. You murdered Him. And the wicked thought that they were getting rid of a hateful enemy. We are destroying this man who threatens our position, our livelihood. We're getting rid of him. God was in control of their actions. God was using them to do this. To make, Isaiah says, a guilt offering. Literally, a guilt offering for sin. God viewed Jesus as the sacrificial lamb offered for the sins of His people. It's clear that Isaiah has in view here all of the lambs that were crucified in the Old Testament. The people at that time understood the imagery that Isaiah is using here, the picture of a lamb that is slain in the place of the people. The people were able to see in those sacrifices that God instituted the great justice and the mercy of God. God in those lambs that He appointed to be sacrificed for the people showed His justice saying to the people, you are sinful. 
And because of your sins, you deserve extreme punishment. Blood must be shed. You deserve to die. But then God showed His mercy in this, and that, and Isaiah is saying this in verses 4-6. through six, God determined that He wasn't going to kill the people, put them to death, punish them for their sins, but there would be a lamb. A lamb will take their place. And this is what the Lord will do. The Lord will take our iniquities. He will take our transgressions, our sins, and He will lay on Him the iniquity of us all. That lamb will be our substitute. He will take our guilt. God will mark our sins upon Him. Oh, God doesn't forget them. He doesn't simply cast those sins away. He knows every single one. He marks them. But He said, not on you. I will mark them on the Lamb. And He will be your substitute and die in your place. Well, now Isaiah is in the Old Testament pointing the people to the perfect sacrifice. The one Lamb of God that will actually take away sin because He is without sin. We and the people of Israel here in this chapter see our sins. The people speak. We speak with them. We speak of our iniquities, our transgressions, our sins. But this one, the servant of the Lord, He is without sin. Sin. Isaiah speaks of that here. Verse 9, the immediate context. He had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. This is the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice too because this was no lamb. That's part of the wonder of the prophecy of Isaiah here. In the Old Testament, it was always a lamb. It was always an animal that was shown to the people as their substitute. But here in Isaiah 53, it's very clear that it will be a man. It will be a human being who will come. He will take the place of the people. He will take their guilt. He will pay for their guilt. And on the basis of that payment, He will make forgiveness possible. Those lambs, those lambs couldn't actually suffer for the people or pay for their sins. They could experience the physical suffering. Physical death. But they didn't have souls like men. God couldn't bruise their souls. Punish them with hell in the place of the people of Israel. This is the wonder of the Incarnation. The wonder of God. Eternal, ever-blessed God taking to Himself a human nature with a human body and a human soul just so that He could do this. take our place as a man and offer Himself body and soul as a sacrifice for our sins and endure from from noon to 3 o'clock that Friday during the three hours of darkness all the hell and the wrath in His soul that we deserve for our sin. Understand, this is what the wicked have waiting for them in hell. They won't suffer merely physically like an animal. This is what will make their suffering eternally in hell So, so miserable. 
they will face the blow of the heavy hand of God. Destroying them. Bruising them. For eternity. That is what we have been delivered from through what Isaiah speaks of here in the text. This is our salvation. Our souls will not be bruised by God in hell. But there's more. There's more. On the basis of this perfect sacrifice, there will be blessing and prosperity for Jesus Christ and for His people. Isaiah speaks of this. He shall see His seed. He shall prolong His days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. God determined that Jesus Christ would be first. And that through Him there would be seed. That is, God determined that Jesus Christ would die to pay for sin in order to establish a kingdom, a nation of people, a church that includes all of God's people chosen from eternity. Jesus Christ is first. He is, according to Colossians 1, verse 15, the firstborn of every creature. He must be first into this kingdom because He needs to lay the foundation of the kingdom in His blood, make the way open for this seed who by nature is sinful to be able to be in this kingdom. And by His blood, Jesus Christ adopts the family of God. God is able to see His seed, sons and daughters, spiritual sons and daughters, adopted through the blood of Jesus Christ that He shed when He sacrificed His soul as an offering for sin. Isaiah is able to see, you understand, not only that Friday, but Sunday too. In the resurrection, this is what we see in the text when it says He shall prolong His days. God will lengthen His days. That can only mean that He who would die would be brought back to life. God would give Him life. God would give Him long life. And then see as the fruit of that resurrection life, many others brought to life. And this is what Jesus Christ does in His resurrection life. He brings His people to life. Through the wonder of regeneration, pouring His Spirit out on His people, sending forth His Word to gather His people into His kingdom. This, this is the pleasure of the Lord. This is not merely the plan of God. This is what delights the Lord. This is what brings Him joy. This is what God wants. This is why God sent His Son to die on the cross. So that He would pay for sin. So that the way would be made for the people of God to be gathered into His kingdom. And Isaiah, Isaiah then sees Jesus Christ not only dying to lay the foundation for the church, but he sees Jesus' work prospering the pleasure of the Lord and gathering, defending, preserving His people. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah speaks. He speaks of the ingathering not only of the Jews, but of the Gentiles, the remnant, according to God's election, eternal election of grace. And so he sees Jesus building the kingdom. And he sees Jesus delighting. Verse 11, He there, He shall see the travail of His soul and shall be satisfied. By His knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. That's Jesus. 
Jesus Christ is going to see this. He's going to know. He's going to see the building and the prospering of the kingdom. And so the fulfillment of this is what's going on right now. Jesus Christ, having ascended into heaven, sitting at God's right hand, seeing, seeing the salvation of his people, rejoicing every time the church gathers for worship, every time a sermon is preached, every time the glad tidings of salvation are declared to sinners, building up his people in their faith, gathering those who are unconverted into the church, bringing them to salvation, building up the church. He sees his seed here tonight. He sees his seed walk by faith in the midst of this earth, confessing faith in him, confessing sin, turning from sin, walking in obedience to his commandments, serving his kingdom. It's the pleasure of the Lord to say, preserve, to build up the kingdom. Jesus is doing that. He's seeing to that now from heaven. But finally, Isaiah sees eternal life in heaven. That's really what the text is speaking of. How long? How long will the Lord prolong His days? Forever and ever. One day, Jesus will return. He's going to see the fruit of His death on the cross and the resurrection of all of His people and the justification of all of His people in the judgment day and in the glorification of the church. Then, then, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper forever. This is God's good pleasure. And because He's sovereign, because He's planned it, He will do it. No one will stop Him. Amen. Father in Heaven, we thank Thee for Thy Word, which not only assures us of Thy sovereignty over all things, but also assures us of the goal. The goal that Thou didst have in mind and that the Lord Jesus Christ knew too when He gave His life. The goal of forgiveness. The goal of resurrection and new life. The goal of eternal life and an eternal kingdom, a kingdom of glory in which Christ shall reign, and a kingdom in which His elect who number as many as the stars in the sky and the sand which is by the seashore, the elect will dwell in glory too. We pray, Father, that we may continue to see on the basis of the power of the cross, the ingathering, the defending, and the preserving, yea, the prospering of thy church. Send thy Son quickly. Do all thy good pleasure, we pray in his name. Amen.